Dr. Neely. The light from the remotely operated vehicle pierced the sunless depths of the deep ocean. I sat nearly a mile away, operating the vehicle from the underwater base where I had been living with five other people for almost two months. The screen on my computer displayed the camera feed, allowing me to witness what the vehicle was exploring. In my hands, I held a rectangular remote, with my thumbs and index fingers controlling the vehicle as it glided over a deep sea coral reef. I was on a mission to scan for a specific type of coral, known as miracle coral. Its scientific name was a mouthful, so we simply referred to it as miracle coral. This species, found only in the deep sea at depths dangerous to humans, possessed various properties, mainly medicinal, making it highly valuable. Miracle. Coral harvesting was done using a remote operated vehicle. My harvesting partner, Leonard, sat at a station next to mine, watching the camera feed on a different computer. His role was to spot Miracle Coral while I focused on controlling the vehicle. We often turned it into a game to see who could spot the spiky coral first. Wait, Leonard, my harvesting partner said. Slow down and rotate clockwise 45 degrees. I complied, stopping the vehicle and adjusting its angle. However, all I saw was an irregular forest of other deep sea coral species as marine snow fell through the powerful beam of light. Rotate clockwise a little more, Leonard instructed. As I did, a large and gruesome-looking creature came into view, floating just a few feet from the vehicle. Leonard laughed. Good Lord, scared the hell out of me. The creature vaguely resembled a shark, but unlike any I had ever seen. What the hell is that thing? I asked. Leonard, uncertain, replied. I think it's a goblin shark or something. It has tentacles coming out of its back or something. The creature had a blade-shaped snout extending over its mouth, lined with needle-like teeth, resembling a mix of a shark and an alligator. Its head turned slightly, revealing a black eye gazing at the camera with predatory interest. Beneath its tail, barely visible due to the camera's angle, were thin, transparent tentacles. Do goblin sharks have tentacles? I asked. No, Leonard said. Maybe some other creature has latched onto it. Look underneath it. I redirected the camera, revealing a patch of miracle coral. It's almost like he's protecting it or something, Leonard noted. After a moment, the creature thrashed in the water, prompting me to back the vehicle off. What's it doing? I asked. I don't know, Leonard said. Suddenly, a cloud of gray liquid emerged from the creature's belly near its tail, floating down toward the coral. The creature swam away quickly, revealing a brief glimpse of its tentacles. Did it just piss on our coral? Leonard asked. I looked at him, puzzled. Either it pissed on it, or what does a goblin shark do? After our laughter over the goblin shark incident, Leonard and I got back to work, harvesting the coral using the arms on the vehicle. Whatever the creature had done wouldn't deter us from meeting our quota. After all, a substantial bonus awaited us back on dry land. We delicately worked for an hour, ensuring the miracle coral could grow back eventually. After marking the coordinates on our map, I steered the vehicle back to the base. Once in the loading dock with the door closed, I radioed the lab to hand things off to the scientist on shift. Hey, Becky, got a load for you, I said. I saw that, she replied. I'll get it in a minute. Thank you, John. Sure thing. Just uh, be careful. We think a goblin shark peed on it. I burst into laughter before finishing the sentence. 
Becky chuckled over the radio. Is that so? I wonder if goblin shark pee has any medicinal value. I'll leave that for you to determine. Gee, thanks, she said before signing off. Leonard and I decided to grab some food, heading to the tiny cafeteria. Unaware it would be our last meal before everything went awry. After lunch, with a few minutes to spare, I looked up goblin sharks on my company tablet. The creature we'd seen closely resembled a goblin shark, but there was no mention of those sharks ever having tentacles. I wondered if we'd encountered a new species. Not a big surprise given the mysteries of the deep sea. We finished the day without any more luck. No more miracle coral. Most days were like that. The valuable substance was rare. As we headed past the lab after shutting down for the day, Leonard and I decided to see if Becky wanted to join us for a VR game in the lounge. At the lab door, which had a thick glass pane, we saw Becky standing with her back to us, engrossed in something on her workbench. We banged on the door, but she made no move. Must be engrossed in something, Leonard remarked. Shrugging off a bad feeling, we headed to the lounge to find Sarah, a technician, already there preparing for a VR game. Our favorite was mini golf as it provided a relaxing escape from the confines of the underwater station. As we played, screams suddenly pierced the air. What the hell is that? Leonard exclaimed as we took off our headsets and looked toward the lounge door. Is that Lonnie? Sarah asked, her green eyes fixed on the doorway. I set my headset down and moved toward the door. It did sound like Lonnie, and it seemed to be coming from the lab. The station, essentially a large circle, hindered our view of the lab due to the curved hallway. As I peeked my head out of the lounge and looked to the right, a voice to my left startled me. What was that? Ravi, the station director said. Let's go see. The four of us moved down the hall toward the lab Ravi and I in the lead, with Leonard and Sarah following behind. As the lab came into view, we saw Lonnie on the floor, still wearing his lab coat. Oh my God, Ravi said, observing Lonnie's face, a mess of blood and bone, as if his head had been forced into a massive blender. What the, Sarah screamed. The station lights went out with an electronic thud, plunging us into darkness momentarily before emergency lights kicked on. I strained to comprehend the nightmare unfolding around me. The dim illumination barely allowed me to see through the lab door, but Becky was nowhere in sight. Did Becky do this? Ravi asked, disbelief evident in his voice. No way, I responded not possible. There's no other explanation. You were all together, and it certainly wasn't me. Why else would she shut off the lights? Ravi questioned. I'm going to go find her, I declared, starting down the hall. After a few steps, Ravi shouted for me to wait. I glanced back, and they were all looking down at Lonnie's body, which was convulsing as if being electrocuted. Before I could inquire about his well-being, Lonnie's head exploded, splattering white-red goo on Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah. A gaping hole remained where Lonnie's face had been torn apart. Without hesitation, I ran down the hall, determined to find Becky, and worried about whatever had emerged from Lonnie's head. Checking the control center first, there was no sign of Becky, but I noticed the control panel for the station lights had been smashed. A hatchet was still lodged in the panel, which I retrieved as I continued around the circular station. Approaching the emergency escape pods, I knew I would find Becky there. She was struggling with one of the pod doors, 
repeatedly entering the wrong code. I pressed a button, and the door slid open. Becky turned around, revealing a nightmarish transformation. Widened, angled out eyes, a lengthened nose, and a jaw broken by a second mouth with needle-sharp teeth. As she rushed toward me, her tentacle-like fingers wrapped around my left wrist. Panicking, I brought up the hatchet, slamming it into her deformed face. She screeched, her tentacle snapping my left forearm. Despite the pain, I yanked the blade out and struck again until she stopped moving. Gasping in pain, I sat against the wall, observing my broken arm. Suddenly, Becky's body started shaking, and I scrambled away just before her head exploded, sending blood-tinted goo everywhere. Stumbling down the hall, I looked back to see Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah standing together. I raised the hatchet, but Leonard easily disarmed me, and Ravi delivered a powerful punch. Darkness enveloped me as I crumpled to the floor. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in the escape pod room. Ravi and Leonard held me down as Sarah stood over me, her eyes darkening and her face beginning to deform. As she shook, I thrashed, futilely attempting to break free. After a tense moment, a second belly button on Sarah's stomach spewed milky goo all over me. As the bizarre events unfolded, the abnormality of it all seemed to blur. The very fabric of humanity seemed to unravel in the dimly lit depths of the deep sea. Supposed to be a hybrid, part goblin shark, part tentacled creature, and part something else. An organism that hijacked animals for its survival. Ravi and Leonard released me, and with my still altered fingers, I entered the codes on the escape pods. I allowed Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah to climb inside, programming the pods to ascend and release an emergency beacon. Climbing into the fourth pod, I did the same, hearing the whoosh as the other pods launched, one by one. Mine followed suit, hurtling toward the surface. As I ascended, thoughts about the organism flooded my mind. It seemed like it had always been with me, originating from the deepest depths of the ocean. Over thousands of years, it had been working its way up through the layers. Survival was challenging in the deep ocean, where food was scarce, so it sought to reach the upper layers where food was more abundant. However, the creatures it hijacked couldn't survive in the upper layers. They were adapted to the deep ocean. Only recently had it encountered animals capable of traversing between the depths and the surface. These intelligent beings arrived in strange, bright vehicles, and now it had found a way to access them. Peering through the vision dome of my exosuit, I saw the boat I had just been on minutes ago floating on the ocean surface, now a hundred feet overhead. It shrank as I descended toward the pitch black depths. Glancing to my left, I saw the second exosuit descending alongside mine. And while I couldn't see Milford Westing's face, I imagined it, punchable, like a rat mixed with a weasel. He was the billionaire paying generously for this excursion. Still, his wealth didn't make me want to punch him any less. He was also an asshole. Perhaps there was no billionaire without such traits. Or maybe it was just part of the territory. Looking down into the abyss, I saw nothing but darkness, like falling into a black hole without end. I'd keep falling until my rebreather stopped working, or the exosuit lost power. Suffocation in the deep sea would be one of the worst ways to die, but catastrophic failure of the exosuit might offer a quicker end. The pressure at these depths could end a human life so swiftly that the brain wouldn't register the pain of implosion. 
The exosuit, however, was designed to withstand such pressures under normal conditions. A slow and agonizing death seemed more likely. Each time I ventured into the depths, I felt as if I were challenging fate, tempting God or the universe to signal that my time was up. The exosuits were spot. However, my unease persisted, exacerbated by Milford's lack of respect for the dangers of the deep sea. The exosuits were essentially one-man pressure vessels with fully articulating arms and legs, designed to endure the crushing pressures of the deep ocean. They resembled Iron Man suits, but were larger and less sleek, with bright yellow coloring for easy visibility. High-powered lights and cameras were attached, sending feeds to the boat, and we maintained radio contact. Milford, the wealthy amateur diver, trained for only two weeks, insisting he didn't need a diving partner. As we suited up, I couldn't shake the feeling that this dive was different, more unsettling than any other in my career. If Milford got me killed, I vowed to haunt him, though he'd probably hire an expensive exorcist to rid himself of my ghost. How long does this take again? Milford asked over the radio. The descent is controlled to avoid rapid drops, I explained. For your safety. I'm a busy man, he replied. As we descended, the thrusters kept our descent controlled, monitored by the team on the boat for safety. Despite the precautions, Milford complained about the pace, revealing his impatience. I restrained myself from retorting well aware of his inherited wealth and the autonomous nature of his business empire. We continued descending into darkness, the boat disappearing from sight. The powerful lights illuminated falling marine snow and occasional fish. Milford marveled at the depth, asking how deep we were. Check your gauges on your left arm, I instructed. As we approached the midnight zone, I looked up realizing we were reaching depths rarely explored by humans wearing exosuits. The excitement of breaking a record, however, was overshadowed by Milford's presence. The headlines, if we survived, would likely focus on his accomplishment, not mine. If we died, it would be a story of how such a tragedy befell a brilliant billionaire. Jesh, the dive coordinator, provided updates over the radio signaling our proximity to the ocean floor. Her calming voice offered a sense of reassurance. She had found the spot, anticipating a whale fall, making it the chosen location for the dive. Okay, you're 50 meters from the ocean floor, Jesh informed us. We're slowing your descent, she continued. Despite the professional coordination, my unease lingered amplified by Milford's cavalier attitude towards the dangers we faced in the depths of the ocean. React, Milford panics, activating his thrusters to propel himself away. I follow suit, maintaining a safe distance from the unfolding chaos. The isopods, like oversized cockroach-like creatures, continue their aggressive behavior. They are pale pink with segmented shells, 14 legs, to antennae. I've never heard of giant isopods attacking an octopus, and their actions are unsettling. As the isopods assault the octopus, using thrashing legs and sharp appendages to latch on, the octopus manages to escape, sacrificing one of its tentacles in the process. The isopods, now engaged in a gruesome battle over the severed limb, devour it swiftly. I think it's time to go, I tell Milford, my unease growing. The isopods, two of them turning towards us, give me an eerie feeling. Before I can finish my sentence, Milford, in a panic, activates his thrusters, propelling himself away. 
I follow suit, ensuring a safe distance from the unfolding chaos. The underwater landscape, previously serene, becomes a battleground for the bizarre creatures. The isopods continue their gruesome feast, and I can't help but feel a sense of dread. The deep sea, with its mysteries and dangers, has become even more unsettling than I had imagined. As we ascend, leaving behind the dark depths and the disturbing scene below, I can't shake the feeling that we've glimpsed a hidden and malevolent side of the ocean. The isopod's behavior raises questions, leaving an unsettling sense of uncertainty about what lurks in the unseen corners of the deep sea. The ascent to the surface feels like an escape from an abyss that holds secrets beyond our understanding. The ocean, vast and enigmatic, remains a realm where mysteries abound, and the events of this dive will linger in my mind, a haunting reminder of the perils that lurk beneath the surface. Floor illuminated by the submersible's lights my mind struggles to process the situation, and the ominous words from Rory heighten my sense of unease. Who's coming? I ask, my voice shaky in the confined space of the submersible. The deep sea creatures, Rory mutters, his eyes darting around as if expecting something to emerge from the shadows. I glance out of the viewing window the murky depths reveal nothing. Fear gnaws at the edges of my consciousness, amplified by the confined space and the realization that we are stranded in the abyss. We need to figure out what happened and get the thrusters working again, I say, attempting to focus on a solution. Rory nods, his eyes reflecting the anxiety that grips us both. We check the controls, attempting to troubleshoot the issue, but nothing seems responsive. They're getting closer, Rory whispers, his breath hitching. Panic sets in as we fumble with the controls, desperate to regain control of the submersible. The darkness outside seems to close in on us, and I can't shake the feeling of being watched. Suddenly, the submersible jolts, sending us both lurching forward. The lights flicker, casting eerie shadows across the cabin. The submersible shudders again, and I realize with dread that something is impacting it from the outside. They're attacking, Rory exclaims, his eyes wide with terror. I peer out of the viewing window, and in the dim light, glimpses of shadowy figures surrounding the submersible. Bizarre, otherworldly shapes move with an unnatural grace in the inky blackness. We need to defend ourselves, I declare, my mind racing for a solution. Rory fumbles with a storage compartment, retrieving emergency flares. With a sharp motion, he activates one, casting a red glow in the cabin creatures outside react, their movements becoming more frenzied. The submersible rocks as the creatures continue their assault. I spot tentacle-like appendages and bizarre alien forms pressed against the glass. Fear and fascination blend in my mind as I watch the mysterious deep sea creatures. Despite our efforts to fend them off, the submersible's structural integrity begins to weaken. Water seeps in, and panic escalates as we face the realization that our escape from the depths is compromised. Rory glances at me, his eyes reflecting a mix of fear and resignation. We're not getting out of this, are we? I swallow hard, grappling with the harsh reality of our situation. As the submersible succumbs to the relentless assault of the deep sea creatures. The abyss claims us, shrouding our fate 
in the perpetual darkness of the ocean floor. The floor was lit by the Radiance's lights, and it's Rory's baby. He named it the Radiance, claiming he would bring light to the depths of the ocean. What hubris! How could I have admired this man? He's going to get us killed. Maybe we're already dead, and we don't even know it. Can you try them again? Ned asks from one of the two seats behind us. Both Rory and I flinch in our seats, turning to look back. I'd forgotten about Ned and Cole. They're both passengers on the Radiance, here to see parts of the world that only a handful of people have ever seen. Ned and Cole are business partners in a successful tech startup. They're both in their late twenties, but they're looking at Rory and me like we're the only adults in the submersible. And in a way, I guess we are. Something's wrong with my brain, I realize. But the notion is far away, hiding behind layers of impenetrable mental fog. Rory speaks, clearly angry. I've tried them a dozen times. The emergency beacon is going. They're coming. Are you sure they're coming? Cole asks in a boyish, frightened voice. Of course, I'm sure, Rory snaps. I designed the emergency beacon myself. I know how it works. You also designed this submersible. And now here we are, stuck on the bottom of the ocean. For a long moment, I have trouble determining who said that. But I soon realize it was me. I said it. Strange. It was like someone else was controlling my voice. Rory glares at me. I glare back, watching the beads of sweat coalesce on his forehead. It's hot, so hot. Why? An alarm blares, and the two screens on the control panel flash a warning. I glance at the nearest screen, some part of me understanding what the warning says, but that understanding seems to float away. A moment later, Rory asks, carbon dioxide levels rising. Turn it off, Ned shouts. It's too loud. A sudden flash of clarity comes to me in the form of a list of symptoms. Too much CO2 can cause hypercapnia. Symptoms of hypercapnia include confusion, altered mental state, paranoia, seizures, and even death. Where are you going? Ned shouts again. I turn to look back in time to see Cole rushing into the rear chamber of the submersible. He shuts the heavy door between the two chambers. What is he doing? I think, my flash of clarity fading away like a rock dropped into the ocean. The alarm is still blaring. Without thinking much about it, I reach out and hit a button to turn it off. Hypercapnia. Carbon dioxide. These seemingly desperate thoughts float through my mind like puzzle pieces belonging to entirely. On his back, and he crumples to the floor. The emergency oxygen tanks are crucial now, and I need to secure them before they carry out their plan. I turn back to the chamber door, still partially ajar. With a renewed sense of urgency, I manage to force it open further. The submersible is small, and every movement feels like wading through water. I stumble back to where the emergency oxygen tanks are stored, my hands shaking as I fumble with the latch. Ned and Rory are both incapacitated on the floor, each groaning in pain. I can't afford to waste any more time. I grab the tanks and start dragging them towards the front of the submersible. The air is thick with tension and the remnants of the fire extinguisher powder. The thought races through my mind that this might be our only chance for survival. As I secure the oxygen tanks in place, I glance back at Ned and Rory. They're still on the floor, weakened and disoriented. I need to act quickly before they recover. I make my way back to the control panel, my mind racing. Warning lights are still flashing, and the blaring alarm has ceased. 
The submersible is a claustrophobic battleground, and the only way out is up. With a deep breath, I activate the emergency beacon once more. The signal pulses into the depths of the ocean, a desperate plea for rescue. I can't shake the feeling that our time is running out, and whatever camaraderie existed among us has dissolved into a fight for survival. The submersible lurches slightly, and I grab onto the control panel for support. The rescue team is our only hope now, and I pray that they receive the distress signal in time. The weight of the situation settles heavily on my shoulders. As I wait, the submersible feels like a fragile vessel suspended in the vast, dark abyss. The radiance that once symbolized hope now casts eerie shadows on the strained faces of my companions. The horror of our predicament sinks in, and I wonder if we're fated to become a haunting tale whispered among the depths. The silence is deafening as we wait for the rescue that may never come, surrounded by the oppressive darkness of the ocean's depths. Sealing an alarm, the sound is followed by a strange creaking, like the groans of some ancient sea creature. Panic sets in as I realize the submersible is moving, not upward toward rescue, but deeper into the abyss. I stumble back to the control panel, gripping it as if it's my lifeline. The screens flicker, and the warning lights dance in ominous patterns. I desperately try to understand what's happening, but the controls seem unresponsive. Cole, I yell, forgetting the horrors that transpired just moments ago. What did you do? Why are we descending? Silence follows, and I glance back at the door. No response from Cole. Fear tightens its grip on me as the submersible continues its descent into the unknown depths. The ocean outside the small porthole darkens, swallowing us in an inky abyss. I consider banging on the door again, demanding answers from Cole, but a chilling thought freezes me. What if Cole is no longer in control? What if something else has taken command of our fate? The metallic thunk from outside echoes once more, and the submersible shudders it's as if the ocean itself is closing in around us. I realize with a sinking feeling that we're trapped, not just physically, but in a sinister plot that extends beyond our understanding. My mind races, searching for any possible way to regain control of the situation. The emergency beacon, our beacon of hope, now feels like a distant memory. The reality of our dire circumstances settles in, and I'm left grappling with the consequences of my actions. I can't dwell on guilt now. Survival is the priority. With hesitant steps, I approach the door. Cole, I call out, my voice tinged with urgency. We need to figure this out together. We can't afford to be divided. There's still no response from the other side. The submersible groans again, and a low hum resonates through its metal frame. It's an eerie symphony of our descent into the abyss. As the minutes pass, the darkness outside the porthole deepens. The radiance that once illuminated our path now feels like a cruel trick played by the depths of the ocean. I can't shake the feeling that we've entered a realm where our understanding of reality is as fragile as the submersible itself. Alone in the oppressive silence, I brace myself for whatever unknown horrors lie ahead. I stare at Cole's crumpled form, the extinguisher stained with fresh blood. The rescue vessel, now hovering above, casts an eerie light through the open chamber door. Panic sets in again. Realizing that my desperate act of aggression might have consequences beyond the depths of the submersible. Without wasting any time, 
I scramble towards the rescue vessel. The crew, clad in suits designed for the crushing pressure of the ocean's depths, begins their descent. Their faces are obscured by helmets, making it impossible for me to gauge their reactions. I'm the only survivor, I blurt out, trying to convey a mix of relief and distress. Cole went mad. He attacked us. Rory and Ned are dead. I had to defend myself. The crew members exchange glances, and I can almost feel their skepticism through their visors. I desperately clutch the fire extinguisher, my makeshift weapon now stained with a macabre history. Please, you have to believe me, I implore, my voice wavering. I didn't want any of this. We were trapped, suffocating, and Cole, he snapped. The crew members move cautiously, securing the submersible to the rescue vessel. The tension in the air is palpable as they assess the situation. I find myself caught between the relief of rescue and the dread of the tale I've just spun. As they guide me onto the rescue vessel, I steal a glance back at the submersible. The abyss stares back, swallowing the vessel that once promised exploration and discovery. The radiance that illuminated our descent now seems like a cruel mockery. The crew members, still silent behind their helmets, secure the chamber door. I catch a glimpse of Cole's lifeless body before it disappears from view. Guilt gnaws at me in the face of potential salvation, I suppress it. The rescue vessel ascends, leaving the depths behind. I sit in silence, surrounded by the muted hum of machinery and the weight of the unspoken truth. The journey to the surface is agonizingly slow, each passing moment carrying the weight of uncertainty. As we breach the surface, Blinding sunlight floods the vessel. I shield my eyes, blinking away the disorientation. The crew members begin their post-rescue procedures, still silent and efficient in their movements. I find myself torn between relief and the impending questions that await. The story I've told hangs in the air, a fragile narrative that conceals the horrors beneath the surface. The radiance that promised light now feels like a lingering shadow, a reminder of the darkness we left behind in the depths of the ocean. In the days following the harrowing rescue from the depths, I find myself haunted by the events that transpired in the submersible. The official investigations have begun, and I recount the fabricated tale with a heavy heart. The crew members their faces still concealed by helmets, remain a silent presence in my nightmares. The submersible, recovered from the ocean floor, stands as a macabre relic of the horror that unfolded within its metal walls. No one can fathom the truth hidden beneath the surface, and the vessel becomes a chilling reminder of the thin line between salvation and damnation. As I navigate through the routine of everyday life, the radiance of normalcy is marred by the shadows of guilt and deception. The horror lingers, not in the depths of the ocean, but in the recesses of my conscience. Each night, I am plagued by dreams that blend reality and nightmare. The faces of Cole, Rory, and Ned contort into grotesque masks, accusing me of the lies that sealed their fate. The fire extinguisher, once a tool of survival, transforms into a weapon of remorse, its weight heavy in my hands. The truth is a persistent specter, tapping at the edges of my consciousness. I am tormented by the knowledge that the horror I painted was a desperate attempt escape the consequences of my actions. The rescue vessel that promised salvation now casts a shadow of judgment. In the quiet moments of solitude, 
I wonder if the ocean, with its infinite depths, has retained the echoes of our shared descent into madness. The radiance that promised enlightenment now flickers like a dying ember, a mere illusion in the face of the darkness that dwells within us all. As the investigation progresses, whispers of the unexplained surround the submersible story. Some speak of strange occurrences, spectral figures glimpsed in the portholes, and an inexplicable descent into deeper waters. The ocean becomes a graveyard of secrets, its waves concealing the horrors that refuse to be forgotten. I find myself drawn to the shoreline, staring out at the vast expanse of water that once held the promise of discovery. The horizon, where the sea meets the sky, becomes a boundary between the tangible and the unknown. The radiance has faded, leaving only the lingering shadows of a horror that defies explanation. The ocean, with its timeless mysteries, keeps the truth locked away in its fathomless depths. The tale of the submersible becomes a cautionary whisper, a reminder that some horrors are best left buried, obscured by the relentless waves that wash away the sins of the past.